We're so excited everybody's here. Uh, hopefully you will see on your screen uh, a slide that says lunch and learn. And hopefully you're eating your lunch. Or if you're not, you'll be thinking about eating a good lunch maybe when you're done, because eating is really important in taking care of ourselves. Um, hopefully you can see there's a sort of Q&A kind of chat um, box you can pull up on the side if you haven't already. And if you don't know what we're talking about, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little blue kind of circle that looks like a speech bubble. And if you click on that, um, you can enter in some questions. If we ask you questions, you can answer in the chat box. And also, um, when it comes to Q&A, if you have specific questions for us, you can also put them in there. So please feel free to use that. And then in terms of tech support, Irfan, is it, is it Tiz who's helping us today in terms of tech questions? Yeah. Okay, so you'll see actually a name when you say two in the chat box or the Q&A, you'll see that you can also select, uh, I guess it's the host you would ask the question to. Would that be right, Irfan? I'm just wondering who you direct a tech question to if you had one. I think we can just have a general, um, just put them in the chat box and then we can all see them. And then we'll all see it. We'll take them in the okay. end, yeah. Yeah, but if it's a tech question about right now, don't worry, we won't wait until the end. Mm -hmm. So for that, you can just um, maybe um, send a question to the panelists or to the host. Mm -hmm. um, and are you the host or fun or is the host? I'm the host. host. I'm the host, yeah. Okay. All right, well, beware if you send the question to the host or fun, we'll only be able to answer you when he's not speaking because we're going to take some time <laughs> to speak And uh, yeah, it's... Um, <clears throat> For those of you who um, haven't joined us before, this is actually the second talk in a series of talks that we're giving um, from the Azraeli Adult Neurodevelopmental Center, looking at issues around mental health for people with developmental disabilities. So we met last month, um, there are over 100 of us talking about healthcare communication, which is really important, uh, especially right now, I think, whether it's sort of an emergency kind of healthcare situation or just planning and being proactive around communicating about healthcare needs. Um, so we actually have a YouTube link, I think, of that talk if anyone did miss it. And maybe we can share that in the chat box at the end of this discussion or in an email to people after today. So we're super glad that you're here. We're focusing on assessment today, but we will have two more talks in the next two months, one looking at treatment and one really paying attention to self-care. Um, yeah, do you think I think it's time we should just <coughs> dive in. I think so. We've got about 47 people signed on, so let's get started. Beautiful. Okay. Today's session is, as we mentioned, about assessment, getting help from mental health concerns. Um, and these are our presenters for today. So I'll let Yona start by introducing herself a little bit more. Sure. So this is a this is a happy picture of me. I like it because um, if you look really closely, I'm wearing my mental health is health CAMH keychain, and I have three special buttons on my name tag there that if you like zoomed in really close, you'd be able to see. One is our Azraeli logo that we have because we are um, funded and supported by the Azraeli Foundation. Another is a little button that says I am challenging behavior which is kind of playing with this word, the idea, I think, of challenging behavior and the idea that we can actually challenge this whole concept of behavior. So I am challenging behavior, I'm reminding us sort of what behavior is really about or what it means, and we'll talk more about that today. And then my third pin, if you look really closely, actually says I am challenging constipation. And you're probably like, what on earth does that mean and why does she tell people she's challenging constipation? But I'll give you a hint. In our webinar today, when we talk about the letter H, you'll understand why I proudly wear that pin. So my name is Yona Lunsky. Um, I am a proud sister of somebody with a developmental disability, which is um, why I wanted to be involved in this family webinar series. I'm a psychologist and a researcher uh, focusing on mental health and developmental disabilities, and I direct the Azraeli Adult Neurodevelopmental Center. Thank you. Lee, do you introduce yourself? So Lee's on mute. Oh. <laughs> oh boy, technology. I said I'm not quite so crazy about that picture of me, but that's how I look. So <laughs> that's uh, that 
So I'm a wonderful parent. I mean, I'm a parent of wonderful children. I'm a little bit nervous. I'm a parent of wonderful children, two adult children. And uh, I'm also the family advisor with Dr. Yonalumsky's team at the Israeli Center. Perfect. It's Nicole. Good morning, everyone. I think I just want to add on to Lee that she might have wonderful children, but she's also a wonderful parent. And I think she takes on that role for all of us uh, at the Israeli Center. So I, I am also a proud sister and uh, really glad to be able to, to speak to the, everyone today and have a conversation on World Caregiver Day. And uh, so just wanted to acknowledge that. Uh, I'm also an occupational therapist and a postdoc researcher at Israeli. So very excited to be part of uh, the conversation today. So welcome. Thanks, Nicole. And my name is Irfan Jiwa. I am a physician as well as a very proud older brother to 14 year old um, with autism, who is the reason I am in the field that I am in. Uh, I also work as a research analyst on the Azrieli team um, with all of the three people who have already introduced themselves. So very excited and pumped to be here. Um, and I know that we're going to do, we're all going to have some great points to share with everybody today. So let's just get into it then. So just wanted to provide a little bit of an outline on what we're talking about today. Um, so we'll start off by defining some key terms around mental health, mental illness, and dual diagnosis. Um, and then we'll follow this by discussing a few of the risk factors that can predispose or that increase the chance that somebody might experience mental illness um, or mental health problems. We'll also be discussing what it is that you can expect when going in for a mental health assessment, especially in a developmental disability context. Um, we'll be introducing what's called the HELP model, which helps analyze mental health concerns. Um, and then we'll finally be ending with reviewing what we can do while we're waiting for an assessment. Uh, one thing that we do want to acknowledge right now is when we were setting up um, these webinars, um, specifically even this one, we were doing this before all these COVID things happen. And so we discussed sort of how things go um, in a pre-COVID era. Um, but we do know now that with coronavirus and everything that's been going on in the last couple of weeks, um, that the way healthcare works um, has changed a lot. The way mental health assessments um, are happening right now has changed a lot. And also that people's mental health has changed or mental, um, given the context and given the situation going on. So we definitely want to acknowledge that that's something that has happened. Um, and yeah, we can definitely um, have some space for that and hold some questions with regard to that as well. Um, so if you do have um, if you do have any questions, um, please feel free to share them in the chat box. But again, this is um, sort of a pre-COVID um, sort of like flow in terms of how um, things would work, and there would be certain changes, and we'll sort of allude to those changes as we're talking about things. Okay. So starting off with those definitions, uh, mental health, mental illness, and dual diagnosis. So what is mental health? When someone says mental health, the way I like to think about and understand it is mental health is how we feel. What are the emotions that we have? What is our state of mind? Do we feel well overall? Um, and that to me is mental health. How is that different from mental illness? So mental illness is when you have certain feelings, certain emotions, or certain behaviors or thoughts that stop you from doing the things you want to do or need to do, or if those feelings or thoughts are happening for such a long time that they, again, stop you from doing the things that they want to do, or that you want to do or need to do, that's when we call it a mental illness. Um, it's quite normal to have a range of emotions, happy, sad, angry, depending on the circumstances. Um, but when those emotions sort of take over, um, that's when we start falling into the reins of mental illness. Um, and this picture on the right, I think, is a very nice illustration of um, how mental illness can sort of come to the forefront for different people and how it shows up in different people with a variety of different thoughts, feelings, or behaviors um, that can be distracting or not let you do the things that you need to or want to do. Um, one thing that I'd like to say right now is that 
Mental illness issues are something that's quite prevalent in the developmental disability community. Um, various different studies have shown that it's high, as high as 40 to 50% of people who have intellectual or developmental disabilities will also experience um, mental illness issues. Um, and so that's why this is such a relevant topic to be talking about uh, when discussing the health of people with developmental disabilities. Um, and given that, there's actually a term called dual diagnosis. And what dual diagnosis means is when a person has both a developmental disability as well as a mental illness, um, we call that dual diagnosis. So they have a diagnosis of a mental health condition as well as a developmental disability. So that's, that's where that is from. And I'm now gonna ask Nicole to talk about why it is that people with developmental disabilities have um, higher risk of mental illness. So I think just to build on that, there are lots of risk factors for mental illness in the general population and, and uh, as well as for people with developmental disabilities. I think they uh, people with DD can be particularly uh, vulnerable to some of these risk factors uh, through greater exposure to adverse life events. Um, such as bullying, so trauma, stigma, loss, um, depending on your life situation, could have limited control over day-to-day -day, um, choices. And uh, as a result, maybe um, of prolonged stress, have also poor coping and, and a combination of poor coping skills and strategies. So it's an interesting piece in that um, we may, regardless of your abilities. We may all experience these things, um, but this population tends to have greater exposure and less resilience or coping um, when this happens. And another key point I think we wanted to raise here is the idea that um, there's intersectionality through here, which just means that, you know, it's unlikely that you would just have one of these things. You may experience any number of these risk factors. Um, uh, and it's really important that each of these things are acknowledged and, and addressed in, in, in the assessment process. So these are just really meant to show you today and, and get everyone thinking about, okay, well, you know, how much choice and control does my loved one have in their day? How much social support? Are they lonely? Have they experienced trauma? And what might that look like? Um, and stigma in, in the course of their lifespan and how might they perceive that? So. I think that was the key piece of, of that was really just to get people thinking um, about some of these risk factors. So I was going to just uh, chat a bit about this slide. Um, uh, two, two points I wanted to make. Uh, one is that uh, when we talk about this population and why we even need to have a separate webinar at all on mental health assessments in this group is because some people would say that they're underdiagnosed um, and yet they're overtreated. And I'll tell you what that means and I'll talk a bit more about what that means, uh, I guess, a month from now when we talk about treatment. But on the underdiagnosed side, there's a particular phenomenon uh, that occurs, unfortunately, way too much with this population. It's called diagnostic overshadowing. And the idea here is that if you have a developmental disability and you're showing uh, signs of depression or you're showing signs of anxiety, that people can be quick to dismiss those kinds of things and just say, oh, that's just, that's just them because they're disabled or that's just, that's just John because he has Down syndrome, he's like that. You know, so our kind of quick tendency to take things that are really, uh, symptomatic of, you know, uh, mental ill health or distress and, and miss the fact that that's really what it's about and say that's just the disability. So in that way, we're under-diagnosing what's going on when it comes to psychiatric uh, disorders. But then we're over-treated in the sense that sometimes what we do is people have sort of, quote, behaviors. Remember, I am challenging behaviors. And we're very quick to say, oh, well, there we go. Like, let's treat that. And, and one of the most common ways that we'll treat some of those things will be sometimes with the medication, um, which in many cases, if we go through a really thorough assessment, makes a lot of good sense and would be really helpful. But if we're too quick to do that without really thinking about what's behind it and what that means, in a sense, we're over-medicating uh, certainly some people for things that we could maybe understand or approach in a different way. 
So that's the first point. And then the second big point I wanted to make before we sort of get into details around how we do our mental health assessments is this concept that actually when we're thinking about people with developmental disabilities, there's no quick fix. So in the general population, we kind of think about, you know, if someone is, you know, not seeming to be doing that well, there's something kind of going on in terms of potential mental ill health kind of thing. Let's uh, go, let's see somebody, let's fill out a checklist and say, yeah, I've got this symptom, this, and, oh, that means you've got this. Here you go, here's your treatment. It's not that simple uh, when you have a developmental disability to really very quickly say, oh, that's what's going on, it must be this, here's this very simple treatment and off you go, right? Um, with this group, it's a bit of a process, it's iterative. So sometimes we look at something, we have kind of a hypothesis or like an ideal, we think it might be, you know, this might be part of what's going on, let's see if that's right, let's try this and see how that goes, and then let's talk about it some more and get some more information. So even if you have like one big specialist appointment, you know, there may be a really clear idea at that point, but there still may not be, and we, we still may have to go back to it and look at it again, especially, I think, if it's really hard for that person themselves to talk to us about their own experience and what's happening to them. So um, a lot of factors come into play, which is what we're gonna talk about now, but just keeping in mind that even though I think sometimes we're just looking for like the magic answer, um, sometimes it might be incredibly obvious and it feels totally magical when we get that, but sometimes it isn't and it can take some time. Next, I'll go to the next slide. I guess this is my third point that I'm gonna make, I said I had two, and that is that, um, you know, when I talked about the sort of quick fix checklist approach, um, one reason why that doesn't work so well in this population is because it kind of assumes everybody is the same, right? Like we're all cookie cutter humans, and as soon as we start to have problems with um, depressed mood or sleep, we all look like this, and that means it's depression. Right, but the truth is we're not all exactly the same. We can't take a cookie cutter approach. What our sort of baseline is, what our normal, what our everyday, who we are is very unique. And I think this applies especially to people with developmental disabilities. So really kind of remembering this image actually comes from, um, from a great initiative from the UK um, about uh, know your normal. Um, and uh, from the autism community, actually from, from young autistic adults who sort of came up with this concept. And the idea here is that what we are all like is unique to us. And the first thing we have to understand or recognize is kind of what our normal is. Because then when we notice that we're not like our normal, then we know there's a problem and there's something we need to do about it. So we want people with development disabilities to know their own normal. As family caregivers, sometimes we're really, really good at noticing before other people when our loved one's normal is not quite where they are at right now. You know, and whether you use the word normal or baseline or typical or good day, you know, whatever the word is that makes sense to you is what we're trying to get at here. But we have to know for that individual what they are like when they're doing well, what they are like typically, and how this is different. And the more we own that, the more we're aware of that, and the more we also express that to mental health care providers who are seeing um, our loved one for the very first time, they don't know what normal is, right? So they have no way of putting that information together. We're really in charge of helping um, the person in our family to do that, and that everyone's normal really is different. So um, somebody might always, you know, be kind of in your face and loud. You think, well, that's terrible. Why should they? Well, that's just who they are. They're full of energy. They're full of beans all the time. So when they're not full of beans, even if it's easier to handle them, there's still something kind of wrong, right? So kind of knowing that is really important. Thanks, Erfan. Okay, so I think building on that, we wanted to spend a few minutes today really looking at something called the HELP model. Uh, and it's and introducing you to it as a way to that mental health providers can um, really look to understand and as a team of um, the person with disabilities, family members and health providers can start to look at behavioral concerns and, and how uh, individuals with developmental disability communicate distress and eventually to what we can um, what can help them feel better so it was really looked um, it looks at assessment and treatment um, and it takes something called a biopsychosocial approach um, which just means that we look at a person within their context in terms of in their life versus just looking uh, at individual characteristics of the person so in the little purple box there 
It's a sequential way that we look at things. And the first thing we tend to look at is health. So are they experiencing, are these behaviors or that distress a result of discomfort that's happening because of a physical health condition? The E is, will stand for environment and the L for lived experience and P, psychiatric disorder. Yeah, so anyways, we'll go into health, uh, into health a little bit more uh, in depth now. So the health, I think, as I just mentioned, is about physical health conditions. And this is an interesting picture just to, um, to give you some ideas uh, around what sorts of things that we would look for um, that may cause discomfort and distress. So the, our individuals that, um, that we love uh, really vary, will vary in terms of their ability to communicate discomfort um, in suffering. We're going to recommend here a head to toe check and an annual health check. At this stage, primary care physicians and mental health providers will look for screening of conditions, um, maybe at more at risk because of a developmental disability, and also a documenting response to pain. So, in the agency that I uh, worked in, we came up with a distress assessment scale, and there are some publicly available as well, where we start to comment on what does somebody look like on a good day? Uh, and how would they respond to pain um, from an observational um, and behavioral perspective? So would they clench? Would they pace? So when somebody doesn't know them, they can start to say, okay, this is what distress might look like. So caregivers, what can we do it while we're preparing um, is, is really start to observe behaviors. So things like, what does typical sleep look like? Um, what is an ap appetite? What is normal attention? So building on what Yona had said about what is normal um, and also pain and distress. And, and like Yona had said, we can include links to the distress assessment scales because it really does help. Um, and it is really important. And Irfan can, the next slide, what Yona had alluded to before, um, it is really, really important that we rule out um, physical health conditions and pain and distress as a reason for behaviors. Um, and in the, the case of Richard Hanley, he was a young gentleman, 33 years old, with Down syndrome uh, in the UK. He was admitted to hospital for constipation. Uh, and he unfortunately and tragically died two days after surgery as a result of complications um, from his impacted, um, uh, impacted bowels. So, there was multiple uh, failures when they looked at reviewing this case. And part of the key piece of that is that in, in the hospital, they didn't recognize that he was in distress for the two days following surgery. Um, and, and he did uh, unfortunately uh, pass away. So one of the other things that happened when we look at, um, you know, look back at why things happened um, is that his care home changed and as a result, his diet and key workers weren't made aware that he was at risk, uh, high risk of, of constipation. So it's interesting, we have a gentleman totally preventable death. Um, and uh, so we really want to highlight here. And as Yona had said, we need to, to look at that before um, we move to other diagnosis. Um, I think so, and I, I'm sure things can happen concurrently too, but the second major piece that we look at is environment. So environment supports and expectations. In, in environment, I think the key pieces here is we not only think about the physical environment, but we look at family and social networks. And sometimes there can be a mismatch between an individual's needs, interests, preference, and the supports and systems uh, and expectations in place. So oftentimes when we go into an environment, we might just naturally without thinking assess based on our own comfort and levels and uh, comfort level and tall, like what we can tolerate in a space. And our loved ones may have a very different sensory and perceptual experience. So, which can lead to distress. So in this, in this aspect, we start to look at, um, and I can show you on the next slide. Um, 
what assessment and questions you might be asked around environment. And I think the key piece for here in terms of preparing is start to think about, okay, well, have there been changes in caregivers, staffing, environment, any of their occupations and what they do in a typical day? Um, and then sensory and, and at a person level, accommodation. So how does somebody, your quiet times, uh, times of the day. What are the expectations in the different contexts and their different roles in their life? And what are the supports and accommodations that they drive? And I, I actually think families and, and loved ones are going to help support and, and teach and educate about this. So the key piece, I think, for caregivers at the stage is to you know map out uh, a day in the life of your loved one. You know what does a daily schedule observe? How your loved one reacts to situations over the course of the day? Lots of things I think we take for granted um, just in our everyday lives, but they're really important keys and clues um, to what might be going on in the environment. So the L uh, refers to lived experience. So the inner world and emotional experiences of, of our loved ones. And lived experience is a bit of an interesting term. You know, we could argue that every experience is lived, but I think in the next slide, we can give you some examples of, of what lived experience um, might be like in the context of a mental health assessment. So thinking about what experiences may cause emotional distress and can lead to our loved ones communicating their distress or behaviors, some of that stress response about fight, flight, or freeze. Um, and, and I think part of it could be changes to routine, uh, change in social connections if caregivers change, um, friends move away, death and grief um, in terms of a lot of people that I support have lost loved ones and we might not have done admittedly a great job recognizing how to validate those painful emotional responses um, but but if we can validate those emotional uh, responses it can be a very powerful therapeutic intervention so the first part is really trying to understand what that might be and, and adapting our communication to um, to let them connect and have meaningful reciprocal emotional responses. I think we have known that um, there is relief when, when people are understood in that capacity. So I think the key point at this stage while we're, we're thinking about lived experience is, is really to promote resiliency. Um, and caregivers, what we can do at this stage uh, is to start to prepare, is, is identify and document life events. So probably in a, an amazing position to be able to, to know somebody over their lifespan where their providers may not know um, that. So, um, and, and not only in terms of a life event, life course, but the idea that there are maybe specific vulnerabilities or sensitive, sensory sensitivities, sensitivities um, to environment um, that might be really important to know. Um, another key piece is the education, the training and supporting staff about who your loved one is or if the, your loved one's at home, um, at respite providers. So how do we build capacity in the people that support our loved one to really understand uh, these lived experiences? I think the, the final piece is the P. So I think the key part about this one is that, as Yona said, people with uh, DD are often referred for psychiatric evaluation because of behaviors and mood, anxiety, trauma-related disorders are often underdiagnosed. Um, but to ensure good medical practice and, a, and a, a thorough assessment, we really need to look at health environment lived experience um, and how they might diminish behaviors that challenge. And then once that's completed, then we can do a full psychiatric assessment and evaluation. So to look at these behaviors to say, do they meet the diagnostic criteria? Is there a change in their normal and their baseline? At this stage, the assessment might involve 
reviewing prior diagnosis and medications. Uh, and then the next slide will show you there's a number of ways to screen um, and scales that have been adapted um, for developmental people with developmental disabilities. The Glasgow Depression and Anxiety Scales are two scales that, just as an example, can show you a little bit about how we might talk about uh, and questions you might be asked related to um, mental health and psychiatric disorders. So hopefully, I think I'll look to my team and in case to build on that, but I think that's a brief overview of um, the help model. So, um, and then we'll look at to see, okay, well, what to expect in a mental health assessment mm -hmm. um, above and beyond that. So, yeah, so given that, um, you know, you've, you've been through sort of the help model, and again, this is more sort of from your care team, they will be going through the help model to try and figure out what is going on um, when you bring you come in with a mental health concern. So sometimes, you know, it's like what type of questions would be asked? And I think the biggest thing to that I would like, biggest point I'd like to make there is that the types of questions will basically be guided by the help model in terms of trying to figure out what it is behind, um, like what is the cause of these new behaviors or like what exactly is the reason that mental health concerns um, are occurring. So you might get asked a lot of questions around um, previous health and sort of current health conditions. You'll be asked about environmental changes, any lived experiences, and then finally about psychiatric um, issues. But it'd be a lot of sort of information gathering in the beginning where there's a lot of um, questions asking about how long things have been going on for, whether these things have happened before, what previous assessments has been done. Um, and to that effect, um, there's some things that you can do to help in terms of what you'd be bringing in is current medication lists of what your loved one um, is currently on medication wise, because as we know, medications do affect um, a wide variety of um, behaviors as well as mood. Um, previous medications that people have been on, if there's any previous assessments, if you have reports from those, those would be very helpful to provide at your assessment. Um, and I think Nicole was also alluding to this, like some documenting some of the things that have happened in the past videos or pictures. If somebody is having, for example, um, very aggressive behavior where they're um, destroying furniture or something like that, like the room is an absolute mess after even taking a picture of that to show the extent um, of the behavior and the consequences of the behavior can be very illustrative for your care team. So documenting, um, documenting things that are happening and things that are a concern for you. Another question that comes up sometimes is how is the best way to prepare for these mental health assessments? We do know um, for people in this population that sometimes communication, sometimes, or I should say more than sometimes, um, communication can be um, fairly challenging. And so there, are, given that there are some great tools that have been developed um, to help assist with communication and we'll try and improve that communication piece um, and I'll speak to some of that right now. Um, this actually goes back to sort of the first webinar that I had. So there's a lot more detail in that we had, sorry. Um, so there's a lot more detail around the tools um, in that webinar. But just to summarize sort of what was covered there is that um, Surrey Place and the HCARD program have conjointly developed um, tools for healthcare visits. Um, examples of these tools are on the screens in front of you. They're called Preparing for My Healthcare Visit and About My Health. And what this, what these tools provide is a chance for you to convey some of that information in a written format ahead of time um, to the care team um, around, who, for example, the About My Health tool is more to get to know your loved one a little bit better around these are the things that I like to do. This is what is important to me. This is a little bit about my medical history. Um, and this is how I behave when um, these certain emotions are affecting me. So it just gives them, as well as these are communication strategies um, that are helpful um, for me specifically. So it gives your care team or your new providers a chance to adapt to your specific needs. And then the tool on the left that we have here, which is preparing for my healthcare visit, allows you to provide um, some information on why it is that you're coming to see your healthcare team at that particular point in time. Um, and so you'd be able to provide some more detail around, um, around the current concerns. 
So these are things that you could fill out ahead of time um, and involve your loved one as much as possible in terms of you know getting them to think about what is going on and sort of communicate and verbalize that in a written format. Um, these are available on the Surrey Place websites, and we'll be providing links to these tools um, online, and they're fillable PDFs that can be filled in online, saved and updated on your computers, and then print out copies um, can be shared with your care team as and when you um, would like. So now I'm going to pass over to Lee to tell us a little bit more about how family and caregivers can play a big role in the mental health assessments. Uh, we've been talking about this all along. Thanks, Nicole and Yona and Irfan for just um, no one knows our loved one better than uh, family members and the role we play then is so important. And because we know our loved one so well, we can advocate and support our loved one uniquely. And because we have the history that and we can recognize when a behavior or their mood is is an extension of like a long-standing issue or whether it's increasing or whether it's being expressed in a way that concerns you and others. And we're in the best position to reflect on the help model that was shared today. Because medical problems could be missed or they may be attributed to problem behaviors. So changes in environment or lived experiences or challenges due to their poor, perhaps problem solving skills or lack of self-soothing skills or low self-esteem. So coping with stress is more challenging for people with developmental disabilities, as we know, and all the risk factors that Nicole has explained. So we're in the best position to advocate alongside our family member. Sometimes uh, we may feel we are out of the picture and less empowered to advocate than when our loved ones were children. So while we want to empower them um, and we want to to enable their voice to be heard as much as possible in whatever way they can express themselves. We are also the ones who can provide that thorough history. Um, we can make sure we brought all the reports that may be helpful and our perspective of concerns to the healthcare providers to have, to have them have as full a picture as possible. Um, I really like those tools that Irfan just shared, my healthcare visit, because it not only uh, allows a conversation uh, about what the individual wants the caregiver to know, but it also provides an opportunity for the caregiver to um, share strategies, next steps, recommendations, uh, while still honoring the person's privacy and autonomy. So I, just, I think that we all know our loved ones best, and just finding that balance between continuing to let them have a voice, but making sure that we can help to complete it as thorough picture as possible. I never knew about the help model until I joined Yoni's team, but I find that such an incredibly helpful model lens for us to look at as well. We can go through those things ourselves um, and see, see if we're attending to all of those, um, those letters. The next slide, I think, um, is just that in doing this, uh, you know, advocating for our loved one never ends. Um, and by the time our loved ones are adults, we have been caring and advocating for many years. Speaking for myself, I became very tired, have become very tired, and um, it has impacted my health physically and mentally. So I had to really give up this idea that I could keep up this pace on my own and asking for support from others and family members, including friends, ensures that our adult child has others who care, which is a great reassurance for them, for us, and for siblings who also worry about what the future may hold. So I just um, found for myself to seek out community resources. Um, there's some really reputable online resources, like CAMHS has uh, come up with, which will to and have spoken to, uh, we'll talk about a few more of them in a moment. And just, I really think to take care of our own health, um, to exercise, to do mindfulness, uh, just uh, there's all kinds of mindfulness resources now than ever before. And Pam H is offering mindfulness classes on Monday uh, with Sue Hutton um, that's free for all of us to attend. 
um, spending time with friends, just having fun. Like what, what makes you laugh? I've been watching silly movies recently during this COVID um, time and, and other times, just what, what lightens things up for me. Um, and remembering that I'm a person with my own interests. To my own individual, you know, what nourishes me. Um, and workout is very, very real, but unless we take care of our good for me right now. Maybe just this, I think, uh, Nicole, you um, alluded to this earlier, this family distress scale. Um, this is very helpful to me just to go through these questions myself as caregivers and just see where we fall in this continuum of distress. Um, sometimes it just feels like that great uh, sort of level that we've been performing for so many years it may not catch up with us um and and so i find this helpful um this just just scale maybe someone else could speak to this as well yeah i'll just add a few words lee um thank you so much for sort of what you've offered already uh our our fourth webinar the one that's going to be in june is really focusing uh very deeply i think on the family experience and we'll get more into this but it's just to say that you know, when we're thinking about these mental health assessments, it's not just about, you know, my brother or my sister or my son or my daughter. It also affects me as a family member, and that's why this webinar is for family members. Um, and you need to be thinking about how everyone's managing with what's going on. That is part of the assessment. In a perfect assessment, it will be assessed, as will the H, the E, the L, and the P that we spoke about. Um, but sometimes um, people might be a little more uh, myopic or focused in an assessment. So they may just focus on the P. They may not focus on the H and the E as much as we spoke about. And they also may be thinking a lot about what's going on with the whole family, but they may not. So I think doing your own self-assessment and kind of recognizing where you're at and not being afraid to communicate that during an assessment is a really important piece as well. So noticing for yourself, I'm sure with all of us right now, these numbers are fluctuating day to day. It's not bad to be able to look at this and kind of say where you're at today and to know when you start to get to those sort of uh, seven and eight or, or even nine, because when you really need help. Um, and I think that can happen uh, while you're waiting and trying to get supports for your, for your family member with a disability. In terms of, I guess, what we do um, when waiting for an assessment, um, there's lots of different things that um, we can suggest, um, but we do recognize that sometimes assessments take a fair bit of time um, in terms of long wait lists to get to an assessment. So things that you should do while you're waiting to get there is note any changes that are occurring in the time between you've started on the um, referral process and before you're actually being seen. So if there's anything that's really changing, um, it's helpful to note down and figure out, okay, like, track those changes, so to speak. And another thing to do is to, given if those changes are, you find those changes are quite big, make sure you're keeping your team updated. So informing your primary care team, so the people like your family doctor, um, your caseworkers, whoever's helping you out um, with your, um, or helping you make, make that initial referral for a mental health assessment, let them know so that they can communicate that team, communicate, sorry, that information forward, because that may change um, how your referral is sort of addressed and what exactly happens in your mental health assessment um, if things become a little bit more urgent or things like that. And then the other piece that we want to add here is preparing for the appointment in different ways. And we sort of spoke about this earlier um, with regard to some of the um, communication tools or those pictures and videos. Um, but there's also some really good tracking sheets that you can use. Again, these are on the Surrey Place website. But you can monitor some of those behaviors that may be quote unquote challenging or different um, or that may be causing some duress um, at home. So on the left here, we have the direct observation system. So this is just an example fill out of the various activities that somebody might be involved in and then tracking sort of over time 
um, how those activities are taking place or what is happening in which time. So just that you have um, a little bit of data that you can share um, when you are being assessed on what exactly is happening on a day-to-day -day, um, basis. And like, I guess the biggest thing there would be to like sort of figure out, okay, how much aggression is happening on a day-to-day -day basis um, in this example. Um, another thing you could do is monitor. So for example, if we monitor sleep, if sleep is a concern, you could monitor exactly how many hours somebody is spending every night sleeping, and then you can look at some patterns that are happening. And again, um, when you're being assessed, that will be some valuable information that you can provide um, to your care team, and they can say that like, okay, this is, they have a better picture of what is going on. So these are just two examples, but there's lots of different monitoring um, tools that are available on that Surrey Place website. Um, and yeah, and there's a couple of other resources um, that could be that you could start accessing while you still haven't gotten your um, mental health assessment yet. And these are mental health resources, both for yourselves and your loved ones. Um, there are a lot of peer support um, resources out there. Um, Developmental Services Ontario has several resources, 211, as well as maybe your local community living association. Um, Another mental health resource um, that we have sort of highlighted here is the dual diagnosis guide. And again, we will provide a link to that, but that's a good um, con concise um, information guide, which has a lot of information on what dual diagnosis means. And you can start reading around some of the information there, um, which could be helpful. Um, another resource, I guess, that we wanna highlight is we've developed a COVID page, um, which we will link to as well. And there's a section on that web page, which is called Managing Stress and Paying Attention to Mental Health. So there's a screenshot from that page on the bottom of your screen here, um, which has some of those different things. So the mental health guide is that dual diagnosis guide. There's a couple of easy reads um, talking about mental health and some videos um, around things that you can do with regard to mental health. Any other things you want to add from a resource standpoint? So. Um, I, I just was reading through that purple one um, dual diagnosis last night and it's so well written and so user friendly um, so I think you know parents and caregivers will really uh, find that to be very helpful and as Eartha just said the link is right on that page and I also watched the videos last night from the Special Olympics it's just wonderful there's so many uh, great links uh, on this page that we'll share with you. Just in closing that final slide for me, um, you know, when I'm waiting uh, for help or when I'm feeling afraid or I'm feeling like many, emo many, many emotions, especially uh, during this challenging time of COVID, um, and, and when I'm advocating uh, for my son, this slide really speaks to me. Uh, it makes me emotional, actually, because in my early days of grappling with um, the di of getting a diagnosis of autism, I really was on the other side. I was always looking at things through the lens of being a problem, and uh, I, it lost me many years of joy and is not really where hope uh, comes from. Um, so, you know, when I think of um, my loved one, I really want to think of uh, his strengths. Um, I want to speak about him, at, about his strengths first. Um, I need to recognize and celebrate those, especially when I am feeling concerned or afraid or frustrated. Um, I need to look deeper at my loved one's behavior to learn what might be contributing to it and how I can support him best. And just in closing, you know, just to believe in my child, to believe in myself, and to know that I'm not alone. You've got something to say about this slide too. I know you love it. Uh, it's a very powerful slide. I think this slide, and it's a reminder for us. I mean, like I said, we hope that all uh, mental health assessments will use the HELP model. We hope all mental health assessments will include family distress, and we hope that all mental health assessments will balance uh, the problem to be solved approach with the sunset to be appreciated. But 
um, being realistic, uh, having myself been involved in many assessments, both on the clinical side and as a family member, you know, it doesn't always happen this way. And I think as families, that's another thing we can kind of advocate for or even model in the way that we speak about uh, the person in our family who's getting help um, and remembering, I think, that for ourselves uh, and, and speaking up if we want to make sure that that's still being captured, uh, making sure we see that happening. Um, I think that uh, information is power and in this case, understanding as much as you can about how mental health assessments happen and, and how they could happen, I think can help all of us to use the time as efficiently as possible and give everybody as much information as possible. I talk sometimes about how there's two kinds of camera lenses we can use. So we go to see the mental health specialist because they know all about mental health, right? So they know about all kinds of mental health issues and maybe even about a lot of people with development disabilities and those mental health issues, which is great. But what they don't know is the person in my family or in your family. So that's like that more focused lens. And we really wanna balance those two types of wide lens with narrow lens have as good a picture as possible. And I think the more information we have, the more we can help uh, as a team for all of us to do that. So we wanted to leave a little bit of time, I think, for discussion and questions. Um, so we have a Q&A kind of box and maybe people have been putting some things into the chat as well. Um, but we'll keep track of time. If we don't get to your question today, we'll be sending out some resources and things at the end of our talk today. We've also recorded it so that we can share it with people after the fact. Some of the things we spoke about, including some of the tools that we showed and the family guide, um, we'll have links to all of that that we'll share with everybody when we're done. But do you have specific questions for us that we can answer that you can put into the Q&A? So far, I haven't seen any specific questions. The main questions are, have been people asking for um, links to the slides. So we'll be sharing the recording of this webinar after the fact. And a lot of people asking about um, links for the resources. We will be sending out um, a document with um, all the different resources that we've been alluding to um, with clickable links that will take you to all of those uh, specific resources, definitely. Yeah. One of the other links we hoped to have, but uh, we got a little bit distracted by something called COVID, which has sort of made us all take a sharp turn in another direction. We have a really nice website um, that we developed initially for staff called um, uh, nutsandboltstools.com and it's got a number of different um, tools just to help you in terms of healthcare, including mental health care. Um, and we've sort of adapted those tools for families. Uh, we just haven't had a chance to post them on a family nuts and bolts tools website or a family website. So we're sort of getting that stuff together, but we can for sure share the nutsandboltstools.com page, which refers to pretty much everything that we spoke about today. Um, and we'll share that. Any other specific questions on things we covered today in the few minutes we have? While people are typing their questions, just to so say again. Yeah, oh, go ahead, Rufan. Yeah. So a question comes saying, is there any advice you might have specifically for early childhood educators who are working with all types of children? Wow, well, that's a pretty big topic. <laughs> in terms of how to support all types of children and starting to think about mental health. I mean, I think the framework, you know, young children, very much like many adults with developmental disabilities, aren't gonna have the easiest time themselves uh, filling out a self-report questionnaire on what's going on with them. <laughs> so I think that sort of help approach, keeping in mind all the things that can contribute to distress. Sometimes we say uh, the ABCs of behavior, all behaviors are communication. So we see something in front of us in a young child, um, but we need to be thinking about what, what is it that we're seeing, what, what's underneath that, and that kind of layering and looking at health issues, environmental issues, lived experience, as well as potential psychiatric contributors is really important. Um, and then thinking about, again, sort of how the family's doing with what's going on. And not that family causes children to be distressed or children distressed cause families to have problems, but they're all interconnected. So having that kind of family-centered approach really makes a lot of sense. Hope that's a little bit helpful. I, I admit that I don't, uh, my area of expertise is not with young children or early educators, so, but it may be that some of the tools we have for people with development disabilities might be of value. Not seeing any more questions, a couple of different comments coming in. Really appreciating sort of the family um, perspective that Lee provided as well. Um, 
And there's a comment here saying that it's very excited to use some of the resources that have been shared, very relevant um, to some of the work that is happening right now in terms of bridging relationship between paid care caregivers and family. Um, so it's great to hear that. I guess something that we alluded to earlier, but we didn't touch on too much is how things might be different in a COVID era. So I'm wondering if maybe we want to sort of briefly talk about that. That's a question I guess I have maybe. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, we're, we're right in the thick of it right now. Um, go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. I just wanted to mention, Emily had a question around um, how I don't hear. Can you hear me? So um, there's a couple questions, one around advice of how to combat the stigma with getting assessments and help with mental health concerns um, was one question. And then struggling with diagnostic overshadowing. So how do we encourage our GPs to look more closely at it? So I think two really important questions, um, but also COVID is very important as well. So hopefully we can touch on all of Okay, so how about I take a stab? Um, uh, okay, so quick stab at COVID to say, go to our COVID, hcardcovid.com page, where we've put a lot of resources related to COVID. I think, remember that our mental health providers are still working, and there's major mental health issues going on right now for all of us. Mental health has not closed its doors. I think what they've done is we've all closed many of our physical doors because we're trying to have as little face-to-face -face contact as we can, um, but it is still really important to work with mental health providers, and all that stuff we spoke about in terms of information and ways to prepare that only helps, especially if it's a virtual kind of meeting or discussion. So please make sure to take care of mental health and to advocate, which I think fits into this issue around stigma, right? A reluctance of healthcare providers to work with this population, reminding people about diagnostic overshadowing. Um, I, you know, one strategy I have, first of all, we have lots of resources for mental health providers to work with this population. So sharing them sometimes that can be helpful. The Surrey Place website that we spoke about or the primary care um, guidelines and tool website has a number of screening tools that are going to be helpful for you as a family caregiver, but it's actually mainly a site for healthcare providers. So there's a whole bunch of tools for them. So sometimes it's just like information sharing. Did you know actually there's a bunch of resources that might help you with this that's on this website that's, you know, developed for um, family physicians and healthcare providers across Canada. In case you didn't know about it, I can share some of that stuff with you. It might be helpful. I find gentle education. Sometimes, especially given how stressed out everybody is trying to do their best, can be a good approach initially as opposed to a in your face, why didn't you do this kind of approach? Um, because we really are trying to work on this together and recognizing that often the people who maybe um, there's a bit of stigma going on or a bit of reluctance, it's not necessarily because they don't like you or your family member, it's because they may not have been very well educated on these issues themselves. So we can all play a role in terms of supporting people and educating. And sometimes I find that can go a long way. Um, but when it can't, sometimes we have to get a little more assertive, I guess, with the kinds of things we're trying to share or information we're sharing. But again, information is power for all of us. So I think in the two minutes we have to answer that question, that's a couple of thoughts I have. And then there's another question that I can see here. Um, do you have access to any tools that help to determine when a person with developmental disabilities needs inpatient psychiatric care? My experience has been that often they are sent home without care because they have care. Right, so really touching again on this kind of issue again of stigma, right? Um, and also how to make an inpatient experience a successful experience. Um, there's actually a resource specifically in the time of COVID right now that was developed in the UK, looking at inpatient care during COVID for people with intellectual disabilities or autism. And I can maybe share that link after. Um, but for the bigger issue around inpatient care and things to think about, for families, our dual diagnosis family guide does have a chapter that's on hospitalization uh, and um, uh, inpatient admissions, which might be valuable for people to read or think about. Um, you know, one thing to keep in mind in hospital um, is that it's a pretty unfamiliar environment and it's a chaotic environment. Um, and especially right now, um, people who are in hospital may not have a lot of contact with caregivers and people from outside of hospital. So I think as much as possible, we want to think about how we can support people at home. But um, I would say, for example, this brief family distress scale kind of highlighting what's your capacity right now to do that support safely is really important information for people to have in a mental health team when they're trying to make decisions. 
So um, it is a difficult decision. It's an even more difficult decision, I think, right now. But information, again, is power. So helping people understand what the situation is, what the resources are at home, and what the resources are sometimes in the hospital. I think we're two cultures, and sometimes in our families, we think it would be so good if only they were in hospital. And the hospital is thinking it would be so good if only they were with their family. So helping to understand realistically how both of those settings work and when it's appropriate to be in each and what supports we can put in place for people who are going to be really distraught if they leave the setting they're familiar with um, and when, in fact, that inpatient hospitalization is required. Yeah. I think there's just a follow up. Yep. Yeah. Thank you for answering that question. Perfect. So we have a thank you here. I, I want to say sort of as I guess director of our program and uh, someone who's been doing this for a long time, you know, an hour to set aside to join a webinar right now is like 10 hours in regular time, right? So, you know, kudos to all of you for taking the time to think about yourself and to get educated. And um, we hope at least one or two pieces of information were new to you today and that you can use that information. Um, tell us what you think you're going to get a survey after this, please fill it out. Tell us what we missed. Tell us what you need to know more about. Tell us how we can be helpful to you. And we really want to hear your feedback. Um, you can follow us uh, on our sort of social media channels here. But if you don't use social media, you can also leave us a voicemail or send us an email. We really want to work together as much as we can in this time to um, support the mental health of people with developmental disabilities and the families. And we're really eager for all of your feedback to help us do that as well as we can. Um, we do have a number of other events like this event that you can feel welcome to join. We have something almost every day of the week, I think, coming up by next week. So if you look at that little HCARD COVID page that we have that we'll send out, you'll see information on when our other uh, seminars and things like that are. So be well, be safe, stay connected. Thank you very much for joining on behalf of me, Nicole, Lee, and Irfan. And um, take care. Have a good rest of the day. Take care.